I have rarely, I'm sure there are times, but I have rarely in my life not had some kind of opinion or plan uh, for work, for life. It uh, has often served me well, but you probably have all experienced as well that sometimes we can have too much uh, of a good thing, whether it's planning or what. And we can provide, um, you know, challenges for others through that sort of thing. But where do our plans begin? Uh, I can't say that I have always, maybe not even often, remembered where the real root, the real foundation, the real source of my plan should come from. But that's what um, this uh, sermon is, is largely about, is how we can connect with his plan for me, for you. Children, um, are they a gift or are they a duty? A gift or a duty? There's one that's certainly a very dear gift to me. That is our son, Ryan. I don't know. What about two years old? Or when could you fit in a five-gallon bucket? But truly a gift. But do we as parents and do you as parents-to-be, I'm sure you start thinking at some point in time what it might be like to have the joy of parenting and being part of not just having but giving a plan. So certainly the answer is yes. It certainly is a gift, but certainly also um, a duty. Uh, there are many firsts in, in life. We have some fun. We had a, a first uh, just a few days ago, first day back to school. We've got friends that are going to have that first day back. Do you remember the first day of school? This is my picture. Well, not picture of me. I looked for one, or I asked my mom for one, and it doesn't seem that there is a first day of school picture for me, Mr. T. Um, I have a picture of my first year, but I don't know about the first day. This, and I, I, I'm not sure, I'm not even sure if Mrs. T would know, is this the first first day for our daughter Mindy, or is this the second first day? I don't know if this is first grade or second grade, but her little school over in Bend, a first day of school. Uh, you can't really probably see her face. Well, you kind of can. I'm, I'm not sure how excited she is for the first day. What I do remember is she wouldn't give me a hug. But was it about me or was it about her? Again, I might, I might, Dad might say the answer is yes. I'm pretty sure Mindy says, no, Dad, this was all about me. This is my first day of school. But, but children, I, I, I want to ask you, because many of you may have pictures, your own pictures. These are my pictures. But what pictures do you have playing in, in your head your first day as a student? Maybe like me, a dad today. I, I think more often about my kid's first day of things like this than I do perhaps my own uh, first day. I remember in first grade, why don't you think right now, we all got that question, what do you want to be when you grow up? For me, I remember very exactly, I wanted to be an astronaut. Astronaut. Still sounds like an amazing thing to do, but I probably will never be an astronaut. What do you, what, is, what was your plan on the first day of school? I'm glad that we get many opportunities in our plan to have many first days because plans don't always go according to the way we hope they do, right? I had no shortage of 
plans and ideas through life, and I continue to have maybe too many plans of how it would go. But what should be the true foundation of, uh, of our, our plan and our planning? What do you want to be when you grow up? Well, here's a not so, not quite first day of school for, for me, Mr. T. Um, and it didn't go according to plan. I'm going to tell a little bit of that story here in a little bit about, because it didn't, the plan at the beginning was very organized and very purposeful. I remember as I was graduating, this was not the same graduation, but when I graduated from the level you're at right now, I remember my senior year, I told my friends, I'm going to be um, a physics major, or a chemistry major, I'm sorry, and I'm going to have a minor in um, optics, which is in physics, and another one. I had a very exact plan. I don't know that I made it through the first quarter of college with that plan. But life always does keep going. And what do we do with it when the plan doesn't go according to what we had set? Whose decision is it with these things in our plans, our life plans? I think we all quickly would come to... Uh, to a consideration that it's really my plan because it's me. But is it all about me? We know a very well-known story in the Bible. The story of, of Samuel. Uh, his mother was before he was. She was desperate to have a child, but she couldn't. And she, short story, uh, Samuel, Eli came over and talked to her, and, and he told her that God would bless her with a child, and she had committed. She made a plan for her son Samuel before he was even born, that he would come and give service to, um, to God in the temple. Should our parents be a part of our plans? It's our plan. Is it all about us? We might say yes, we might say not exactly all, but the story with Samuel, of course, as we know, how old was he? Do we know how? We don't know exactly, but anybody have an idea about how old Samuel was when his mother took him to the temple to be raised, really, taught to learn from others? We don't know exactly. Some say it was about three or four. That seems so young. I could not possibly do that. Could you turn your child over to somebody else to make their plan of life? Could you make that decision um, like that? Maybe it was around six, six years old, but whether it was really young or six is still to me really young, his mother and he um, accepted that plan in his life. One thing that the scripture about that story also tells is that his mother, and I suppose his father as well, continued to be a part of his life, even, even small as it may be. Every year they would come to the temple, and uh, they didn't come because they had to, uh, because it was not required to come to the, the temple to sacrifice every year if you live too far away, but they came, and why? What was the big purpose? Of course, it was to see their boy Samuel, and they continued to support, and I think that the, the, the Bible tells us that, that she would bring him a coat, would support, and I'm sure would give um, more than just physical support, but hugs. I'm sure there was conversation, and not only things about how much we miss you, but how much we love you, and so continued to be a part of that life. Well, I might suggest the word um, calling uh, in this. Is it all about you? 
that is there some type of, of, of calling, a prompting, um, that both you and maybe other important people in your lives share with you. Parent, their teachers, we have a very important, uh, a, a good number of very important relationships throughout life that God provides for us and we can be ever so grateful for that speak into us uh, and help us with what is our, uh, our calling uh, in life. Our scripture reading gives us some kind of guidance as well as to, uh, to where to get these, these answers about life, uh, life decisions. Whether it's about what I want to be when I grow up and the many, many, many more. The whole range of experiences. Because is it, is it just the big ones that require the big decisions? What do I want to be when I grow up that require our 100% focus and attention that, that take um, our attention and focus into this? No. I mean, we can all say that there are many, many. Others might, might observe uh, with us and say, well, that's a little decision. But to us, whether, whether it seems small or not, it is, it's everything in that moment anyway. So great counsel that uh, this is God speaking uh, to, to us, not just those of the day, but to us too. But to listen to me and you will eat what is good. The next line talks about food, but I know, and you probably know as well, that it's way more than just food that this scripture is talking about. It's talking about life eternal. It's talking about the most important decision, and that's our relationship with Jesus and, found and, and salvation. Listen to me, and you will eat what is good. You will enjoy the finest foods. Come to me with ears wide open. Listen, and you will, what? Find. You will find life. It's not any bigger than that, but it's all the little pieces all the way along that, that, that fit into that. Um, so listen, uh, he says. Come and listen. We know very well, whether we're currently parents or parents-to-be, that it is, we don't really probably think of it as duty. We think of it as joy, but it is an important responsibility. Um, but it's not just parents. We too have responsibility. Individuals at whatever age we are, whether it's six years old like Samuel when he left to go learn, continue to grow, um, from, from his teachers, from his pastor, whatever he saw Eli as, but he too, we know the story. We know that, that Samuel knew that he had responsibilities to listen and responsibilities to choose, to make choices, and to answer. Same thing happens for us uh, as well. Well, I told you that I was going to tell a little of my story and, uh, and how I might have answered in a way, what do I want to be when I grow up? You probably understand, just as I do, that we keep asking that question throughout every age of life, and I think it's kind of fun in a way. But my education story started. Um, I was flipping through some pages in, in old yearbooks and the Hood View Vista, that's the first school I went to, Hood View, up out of Portland for four years. So it started there. My story started, at least as far as education is concerned, started there at Hood View for four years. And then we moved across the river into Vancouver and I went to a school called Fir Grove. It's not there anymore sad, but, um, but I have friends from there, fun to talk to them, and then it went on to, many of you know that my uh, high school, alma mater, Columbia Academy, 
which I try to remember the right time not to wear a Columbia Kodiak's hoodie, right? We want to be careful about those things. Um, we're going to be there, a bunch of us here, uh, next weekend, and, and, and I made sure, you know, is it okay to wear the hoodie there? No, Mr. T, it's all Milo, I was told. So we'll be wearing the Milo hoodie inside the Columbia Academy Gymnasium there. Yeah, yeah. Columbia Academy. Well, during that time, it's not just about school, is it? Uh, there's so much of our learning, both formal and, of course, informal. I went to work after my junior year in academy at Big Lake Youth Camp. How, how many Big Lake Youth Camp staff members in the, in the church today? Do we got a few? We got a few, yeah. Big Lake, I ended up going to another camp, Myvedon, up in Idaho for, for five more years. I spent nine whole years, a big part of my life learning journey and how it very much changed my life. I will admit to you, I chose to go to work at Big Lake not probably because, maybe it was more than I give credit for, but did God call me to go? I know that, that I chose to sign up to apply for the job because I thought, wow, how much fun could that be to go to camp for more than just one week? I mean, camp is awesome. And I thought, I would love to go work at camp because it's fun. There are more important things, way more important things that happen at camp. Young boys and girls meet Jesus at camp. Young boys and girls are led to Jesus at camp. Truth is, even older, teenage, young men and women meet Jesus. I'd already been baptized. I believed. I had learned in Bible class. But I really probably met Jesus as my best friend at camp. As, as not a camper, but as a staff member in my teens, later teens and 20s. But I didn't know that then. My plan was, go have fun. There were moments, certainly, of worship, like we have all the time here in our own church, in our student center, in our Bible classrooms, all over the place, where we meet and connect with Jesus. That's true. I think it was true of me at those times. But my plan was really, fundamentally, at the foundation, at that time in my life, just simply pursue what is fun. I didn't have the maturity to think of what is God calling me to do. But was he still active in my life and guiding me along? I am so glad and grateful that absolutely, whether I recognized it or not, he 100% was. He is always there, even when we don't see him present. Big Lake was a big part of my growing up. I wondered many times, how did I wind up in places where I was going to grow up to be uh, a man of God, to be um, following the calling that God had for me? Because God knew long before I applied to go to Big Lake, that he was going to grow me up there and other places to come. But I, even if I didn't know that, how did it come to be that I would be there? My parents did not go to school with me. Just like my daughter, she was, okay. she, she was begrudgingly okay. That, the picture of, of who took that picture in the classroom, it was dad. Did she want that picture taken? Not very badly. But she, she allowed me um, begrudgingly to come in. She really, I, rem I remember this. We, we pulled up in my big construction truck um, to, the, uh, to the parking lot in the school. And, and this little girl who can't even reach the ground, you know, sitting up in this big truck, 
she's got to hop out and very capable of doing it. Um, boy, as soon, I, could, I hadn't even turned the pickup off yet. The door was open. She was bailing out, and she was almost running to the door of the school. I'm not so sure because she wanted to get there, I think, because she just wanted to get there without dad. <laughs> and, and so she did allow me to come in, but I still didn't get the hug um, there. H how did, uh, did I come myself, you know, as that student, to be in these places? My parents did drive me to places like school, they didn't usually, as I recall, come in. Certainly by the time we get to, to, to academy, some of our parents come here, a very even fewer help us settle in, but some do. Um, my kids now, I think, do like that, that part of dad coming and helping settle in and that sort of thing to build memories and all. But um, my parents didn't do the instruction. Of course they do um, before we go to school, and if we're so fortunate uh, to, uh, to be able to sleep in our own bed, I think boarding school is the most amazing thing in the world. Um, so, so don't get me wrong when I say that there are others more fortunate that get a, get a sleep in their own bed and still go to an Adventist academy. I, I've, I've also sometimes said to people, I think that we'll understand, uh, I hope you understand, that I say, kind of joking, half joking, that boarding academy is a necessary evil. That, because God did create us for families, and I am so grateful that we have a family here. Even when we're away from our biological family um, at other times of the year. So, parents don't get to, to do all of the education. In fact, they um, depend on others, whether it's staff members, whether it's community members at a boarding school, but we're all a very important part of this, this, this whole process. True education, and, and you can see here, we, we might think education formally, but this comes from Ellen White in her book, Education. In the highest sense, the work of education and the work of redemption, the work of our character growth and building to reflect that of God, the work of education and the work of redemption are one. For in education as in redemption, and she quotes the Bible here, no one can lay any foundation other than the one that we already have. And that foundation is Jesus Christ. Very good for us to remember. I don't know. I don't recall. I'm quite certain through elementary school, I didn't understand this. I didn't grasp this. Maybe a little bit more, maybe not too much through high school. Um, but that Jesus... Uh, is the, the absolute foundation of, uh, of, of our education. And we don't just mean in classrooms. So the, the, the true business of education. I did continue. I had a plan. I told you, you know, I'm going to be a chemistry major, and I'm going to get this, and I'm going to get that. And I didn't get through that. I didn't get through that um, that plan at that time. I, I don't remember, I think it was Pastor Chad or maybe it was Pastor Steve, somebody I remember uh, had this, this illustration of, of the master architect. Every day of our lives, right beginning from the very first, when we are born, he lays out a plan for every day of our entire life. That sounds like a lot of work in a human context, but then take and magnify that with every person in this church, every person in this state, this country, this universe, over all the way back to creation that every day the master architect lays out a plan, draws it up to absolute detail for every day of our life. Do we follow 
every piece of that plan? No, not often. But he loves us so much that the very next day, he writes it all over again and makes modifications and things and all of that to make the perfect life for us, our foundation. And that's the thing, you know, to focus on is he loves us so much that he would go to that much work every single day for our goodness. The master architect. I continued my studies, as I said, went on, but when I, when, I, when I recognized that getting a degree in chemistry, I loved chemistry. But what did I, I, I loved parts of chemistry. Um, I, I loved the idea of chemistry and parts of it. It couldn't be more perfect than, than being here at Milo Academy with teachers like Mr. Pratt and Mr. Alder who can teach every day of chemistry. Mr. Pratt let me come in for one day and blow things up, you know? That was fun. That's what I loved about chemistry, was the lab. Not just the blowing up, but yeah, that's pretty high up there. But we gotta have, have fun. But what I realized, I knew it all along, that it was gonna require a lot of hard work and study. And I realized I wanted to go to the gym more than I wanted to do my chemistry homework. So there was a day that I decided, okay, there's got to be something else. But I didn't know what. What do I want to do? I just know that I don't want to do chemistry homework. Um, and so I thought, what, what do I do now? What has God put into my life that I love so much? I would want to do that every day. And I realized what it was. Summer camp. I want to go to, to summer camp for every day for the rest of my life. I was a real simple thinker. I said, sure, that's possible. I would never asked myself or didn't al allow myself to think, is it likely? Is it God's plan or is it my plan? It's okay to be my plan, but are those two paired together, my plan and God's plan? So I said, okay, what does it take? to go to camp every day for the rest of my life. I want to be the camp director, the youth director. Well, who is it that gets jobs like that? At, at the time in my life, when I was going through school, it was a pastor. And everybody who was a youth director had been a pastor. So I said, okay, I'm going to get a degree in theology so I can be a summer camp director and I just put the blinders on so that I could just see camp but not all the other things that we're gonna have to be a part of getting ready to be able to be ready to be prepared to be equipped to be a camp director who leads young men and young women leading young boys and girls to meet Jesus it just doesn't happen like that it takes preparation. Well, I didn't want to see that at that time. I went all the way, not through four years of college, not five years of college. Yes, it was six whole years before I came up to the last quarter, and now I'm supposed to graduate. And then I finally said, I got to wake up and smell the roses. I probably didn't think they were roses, but I finally admitted to myself, you know where I'm not going the day after graduation this year? The day after graduation for nine years, I was headed to camp. This year, I could see back in April or something, I wasn't going to camp. And then I realized I'm going to have to get up in front of a church and I'm going to have to preach? I had to do that a few times in practice as class, and every one of them was awful. And, and I, I realized this is what my life is going to be, and I said, 
made, made one of those decisions. We make too many of these decisions. I'm glad, uh, I shouldn't say I'm glad there's a we, because what do I care about? I should care about the grief that comes into every human life. It is human nature. But I realized that that's where I was headed, somewhere that I really didn't want to go, and I didn't want to learn. I didn't want to grow up. And so, one of those really awful decisions, and I quit. I am a college dropout. After six years, and I quit because I wasn't going to get my way, my plan. I quit. Well, just like Jonah, who said to God, I'm not going to follow your plan. And he gets on a boat. And he goes out into the middle of the sea, and he realizes what he knew before he got on the boat, that not only did God have a plan, but he needed to listen. And he said what I can't imagine. Just throw me in the water. He didn't jump, according to the Bible. Maybe he couldn't. Maybe that was too hard. You know, have you ever... Ah, he needed help. So he got thrown, and God prepared a fish. I was so fortunate that in my Jonah experience, I didn't have to spend time in the belly of a whale. He prepared a church for me to land in. Jan and I, we went home... Um, home for her. I hadn't lived there before. We went home to live in Eugene area. And I remember going to church and teaching Sabbath school and did a little bit of growing up. We moved on from there not too much longer, a few, a few years, bounced around, wound up in Bend, and I built houses. I built my first house. The smart person in the house says to me, of course, you know who that is. She says to me, um, maybe you should go and finish that college degree. Um, we built this house, couldn't build another one until it sold, so maybe this is the time. And it's a miracle story that we don't have time for, but the, the short version is, I went back up to Walla Walla along with a wife and a, like, six-month-old baby. And we went up there, and I finished and then I went back to building houses for many years. Moses had a plan of how he, he knew that he was called. He was called to help his, his family, his Israelite family. But he had his own plan, and he tried it out. And it wound up with, with him running for his life. And it wound up him spending 40 years getting trained to be a leader of people. He had to herd sheep to learn to herd people. And I'm glad I didn't have to spend 40 years herding sheep, but I got to spend almost 20 years building houses. All of these things reminds me of another story, and that's the one of Esther. Because God had a plan for her. She maybe was a little bit better listener Maybe it's because she was a girl. She was a, seemed to be a better listener, and she had good family advisors, like her uncle Mordecai. Well, there came a time, it was very stressful, I'm sure, that she needed to step up. And he said, Uncle Mordecai says to Esther, you know the, the statement in the Bible, that maybe it's for a time such as this that you've been put in this position. I thought, after getting my degree, and it was many years later, that I was the school board chairman over there in Bend. And uh, the principal called me just a few weeks before school was going to start, said, I can't do this. He was having some personal issues. I am not fit to be the principal of this school. I am so sorry. And I told him, God has a plan. You just keep listening. I had no idea what it was. I had no idea. I probably had an idea that I was right. But I told him, you just listen to God, and we'll take care of this. I had no idea how to take care of this school. I ended up um, telling the conference that uh, 
I will be the principal for one year, and then I'm going to go back to building my houses. And they said, okay. And it's about year 21 now. Year, year, year one never ended. Well, it took to go back for year number two. For me to be able to do that, I found out later, you have to have a college degree. It doesn't have to be education. But it was that. We were also building a gymnasium at the time. God taught me how to build things. It was really, I didn't build the whole thing by myself, but I knew how to organize that. There were many things that had come into my life before this point that prepared me for a time such as this. I was not very comfortable with that thought. I don't know how comfortable Esther was. I'm sure it was a very stressful moment for her to recognize that God had put her there for a very difficult role in that moment. It's not always those kinds of things, but I would suggest, it's taken me many years to, to, to recognize that yes, God did bring me to it, prepared me for a time such as that. And you know what? He does the very same thing with each and every one of you. Many times in life. He's preparing you right now. He continues to prepare me, even at 60 years old. We keep on being prepared for what God is calling us to do. And there's a lot of joy in that. Not without hardship, but with lots and lots of joy. I know that's true because I look at every one of you and I see the joy that I have experienced. It was the weirdest thing that first year of teaching. Um, I was excited, but I had a job that I was doing that went very, very bad. Um, house I was building, very expensive house, and there were some issues, and I wasn't there to be able to take care of them. And I don't know if I had even been there to take care of them, if I could have done them well or right. The short story was that I ended up having to uh, agree um, with lawyers, both from my side and the other, that I would give up this job and I would pay. And I would pay a lot to, to make this thing go away. And I would go each day. It took weeks to get this agreement. And I would go to school, maybe not every day, but it seemed like every day, with this big, heavy cloud. And it felt terrible. And I would go into staff worship, and I would feel a little bit better because I was with good people that cared about me, would give encouragement to me. That's why family, whether parents and siblings or a church family, friends, are so important in our life and experience. They got me through a lot of that, but I still was only feeling a little bit better. But the thing that was, just blew my mind, I would walk down the hall to my classroom, and I would start hearing voices. These were real voices, not the ones that should scare you. <laughs> I would hear voices coming into the hallway. Some would come into my room. Some would go into other rooms. And then, as every day started out in the classroom, in every classroom, a worship, and we would sing songs, and we would read about Jesus, whether it was those voices or the smiles or whatever, I would realize by the time that classroom worship was over, I couldn't have been more happy. I don't know where it went. I know who took it away, and I know what he used to take it all away. It was all of you. Whether it's my first year, somebody else's first year, whether it's the last year, the current year, it is those people around us. For me, it's you students, you colleagues that take those burdens and those heavinesses away. But following God's plan can really make all the difference. Well, that's my story. What is your story? I, I um, just want you to think through different examples, maybe mine in a small way. Maybe it's Esther, Jonah, Samuel. What is, what is your story? 
And what is it now? What is it going to be? Gift or duty? The master architect, he's ready to do it every single day for us. Whether we follow it precisely, whether we see it precisely or not, he's willing to make it for us every day. How great is our God? I mean, if we could measure that, I, we can in some ways, but somebody that's willing to do that much for us, immeasurable greatness. We're going to sing about that as the, the praise team comes up, but that, I would say, is the most amazing love. What is our part? God's part, he makes as a plan. Our part, as the scripture um, earlier said, listen. For us to listen. And then for us to choose to make choices and to follow. That's my prayer for, for every one of us, that we can be reminded regularly by those around us that we have an amazing God. How great is our God?